Thanks, uh, thanks, Dan. It's uh, it's a great pleasure to uh, to be here um, talking about um, uh, something that uh, I think has gotten a lot more attention recently, and I, I think is is. Uh, a cardiac surgeon told me a few years ago that uh, this was inevitable, that some number of cardiac surgery patients will just develop AKI and we shouldn't get excited about it because it just happens. And I think, uh, I think one of the ideas here is that uh, a lot of these complications don't need to happen. Uh, certainly uh, we probably will never get AKI to be a never event, but hopefully we get a little bit closer. And I appreciate, uh, I wish I had a, a YouTube video of uh, Kevin's talk because I, I'd like to play that in front of every AKI talk that I give because because I think there's a lot of uh, uh, misconceptions about acute kidney injury that uh, that we commonly see, and I'll talk about a few of those. Uh, my disclosures are, are here. I am going to talk about some of the products that these companies make. In particular, I'm going to talk about a biomarker that's made by Astute Medical, one of the uh, sponsors of this um, of this symposium. I think the first thing we have to deal with is what are we talking about when we're talking about uh, acute kidney injury after cardiac surgery. Um, what, when does it happen, and, and what is, when, would sh when should we adjudicate the event? Is it a week after cardiac surgery? Is it 48 hours after cardiac surgery? Um, and we know in experimental models that the emergence of a decrease in, in, in urine output occurs relatively rapidly, but that's not specific. We know that an increase in serum creatinine can be delayed by 24, even 48 hours, but not by one week. And we also know that AKI can evolve over the course of uh, several days. So if it begins 48 hours after cardiac surgery but doesn't peak in its severity till one week, that's still probably cardiac surgery associated AKI. On the other hand, if the patient's renal function is stable for four days and then suddenly deteriorates, it's hard to attribute that to something that happened four days ago in the OR. And so I think we need to be clear on exactly what it is that we're, uh, that we're talking about. Um, this is a, a slide that I often show, um, a study looking at the effect of cardiac bypass, on cor cardiopulmonary bypass on uh, AKI in the perioperative setting. And it was remarkable that these authors decided that it would be reasonable to use the endpoint over 30 days after cardiac surgery. I don't know about you, but it's hard to understand how anything one could do in the OR, whether it's on pump or off pump, uh, could affect outcomes as late as 30 days. And you can see quite uh, clearly here that if you look at 24, 48 hours after surgery, defined as an increase in serum creatinine by at least 50%, um, you can see that there was a relatively large effect size, about a 25% absolute risk reduction, uh, which isn't quite 30%, but is, is quite large. Um, whereas if you look at five days after surgery, that's already deteriorated to a 16% absolute risk reduction, and it's exactly the same at 30 days. So there's clearly no further benefit, if you will, of doing off-pump cabbage in terms of preventing what happens to patients after uh, five days, certainly, and probably not much going on after, uh, after, uh, after 48 hours. Indeed, 63 to 70% of all AKI happens within 48 hours, 88 to 89% within five days. And this isn't just true for cardiac surgery. This is general surgery. This is a study that we just submitted uh, recently where we looked at the, uh, uh, the occurrence of AKI after general surgery, and you can see that 41% of AKI after surgery occurs in the first 48 hours, another 18% occurs after that point. My suspicion is that this is all related to what's happening in the OR and probably, as you can see from the risk factors, uh, that I'm not gonna show you, but trust me, uh, the risk factors that these patients have are predominantly things that they brought into uh, the surgery and what's happening during the surgery. Whereas all this stuff out here, um, this is really on us as intensive care. Uh, this is stuff that's happening, uh, drugs that have been added. These are complications that are then leading to acute kidney injury. One of the common causes of acute kidney injury out here is sepsis. And that's happening as a consequence, uh, not directly related to the surgery itself, but a post-operative complication. Interestingly, and I haven't looked at this in cardiac surgery, but we will, 13% um, of general surgery patients actually have evidence of AKI prior to surgery. Now we call that surgery-associated AKI, but it's probably the patients are coming in with uh, surgical disease and they have AKI. And I suspect the same thing is true of cardiac surgery. These patients get balloon pumps, they get caths, they get all sorts of other exposures, low cardiac output uh, that w may result in, uh, in acute kidney injury. And then they go to the OR, they have a perfect surgery from a kidney standpoint, and they still manifest their AKI within 24, 48 hours. It's nothing to do with the surgery itself. So um, what does this look like? I, I 
to just show you quickly, uh, this is some data from our, our shop. It hasn't been published yet, uh, hasn't even been submitted. We're still analyzing the data, but it's pretty mature, so it's unlikely to change, so I'm willing to share it with you. This is uh, 6,600 patients from five uh, centers in the in, uh, in, in, in University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. Uh, we have the advantage of having multiple centers that do cardiac surgery on the same EMR. So I can do large studies with the data, uh, having a single definition of acute kidney injury, which is quite helpful. This is a complicated slide, so I'm just going to show you just a couple pieces of it. The columns here represent urine output criteria for AKI by KDGO. The rows represent serum creatinine. And what you can see here is if you have no AKI by either criteria, you have, for example, 90-day death or dialysis rates are very low. It's 2%, and all that's coming from death. No one develops a, a need for dialysis. It's uh, uh, vanishingly rare. But you can see that if you don't have AKI by serum creatinine, so no jump in serum creatinine, but you just have transient oliguria, which stage one is six hours or less, or six hours, between six hours and 12 hours, um, that's not significant. That's not meaningful in cardiac surgery pain. This is very different from sepsis. If you have six hours or 12 hours of oliguria in sepsis because you're getting four, five, six liters of fluid resuscitation typically, that's AKI. And it correlates with long-term outcomes. It correlates with biomarkers. It's AKI. But cardiac surgery, this probably, at least in North America, probably represents um, aggressive fluid removal on the, at the end of the case on pump, quite honestly. I think this is perfusion is taking off fluid. Then we're adding back fluid in the, in the ICU. And the kidneys are doing exactly what the kidneys should do in a low-volume state, which is to not make a lot of urine. Now, if that persists for more than, six, for more than 12 hours uh, and you get into stage 2, Two, this becomes statistically significant. Your mortality or dialysis rate goes up to 4%, but it's certainly not that impressive as a, so some of these patients might have AKI, but probably the majority still have just volume depletion. If you get to stage three, which is anuria, or 24 hours of oliguria, then the rates of death or dialysis at 90 days jump up to nearly 10%. That's significant. And that's, of course, all of this is, un, is completely behind the curtain in terms of what we monitor uh, for STS, et cetera. And now, if you, another interesting thing from this slide is if you just develop stage 1 AKI by creatinine, so your creatinine goes up by, 0.5, by 50%, goes from 1 to 1.5, and you develop six hours or more of oliguria, your death or dialysis is exactly the same. In fact, it's even a little bit worse than having anuria for, or, or oliguria for 24 hours. This is, again, real AKI. Now, I, I grant you, it's not nearly as bad, and this is now getting down into STS reportable stuff, uh, death or dialysis rates approaching 60% in some of these patients. Uh, but this here is still card-carrying AKI, and we need to pay attention to it. Now, I've already told you urine output is not that useful until it's prolonged, and by that time, usually the serum creatinine is elevated, although in, in the few patients I showed you, it doesn't elevate. Uh, probably those are patients with, with good uh, renal reserve uh, or who develop so much fluid resuscitation that their creatinines never went up because you diluted it. Uh, what else can you do? You can measure AKI biomarkers. This is NGAL. NGAL has excellent negative predictive value. The positive predictive value is not quite as good, and we haven't had an FDA-approved test for it in the United States, whereas this marker we do. This is TIMP2 and IGF-PP7. These are cell cycle arrest biomarkers. They're FDA-approved. We have very good uh, uh, standardization and cutoffs for these for these markers, and they elevate within hours, maybe even within minutes, less than one hour after the initiation of cardiac surgery, uh, cardiopulmonary bypass, uh, as has been shown uh, by uh, studies like this one. Uh, there's an another study coming out shortly from Vanderbilt that shows the same thing. Uh, this clearly differentiates patients that have uh, or don't have uh, or don't develop acute kidney injury. Uh, this happens with other surgeries, and you see the same sort of kinetic, this is uh, general surgery patients. What are these cell cycle arrest biomarkers? I'll mention this briefly. These were developed uh, using uh, multiple different data sets, including cardiac surgery, and then just simply measuring everything conceivable in the urine and seeing and the blood and seeing what pops out, and it turned out that these two biomarkers, which nobody had ever heard of before, uh, were the best predictors of acute kidney injury across the board. And I think one of the reasons they're advantageous, or one of the reasons they work, is that they're measures of cell cycle arrest, which epithelial cells use as a protective mechanism when they're under stress. Uh, so it's sort of like, uh, it's too risky to divide, 
So they're going to tell each other to stay out of cell cycle, and that's a defense mechanism. It's sort of what my adult children I tell. I say, look, reproduction is dangerous and expensive. <laughs> Don't do it until you're ready. And so these cells will die if their DNA is damaged. So it's dangerous, and there's nothing the cell can do that's more bioenergetically expensive than replicating all its DNA. So the epithelial cells are very well attuned to environmental stress UV radiation, your kidney responds to UV radiation, by the way, despite the fact it hasn't seen that in billions of years of evolution. Um, it still has a hair trigger response and it uses these molecules to communicate that danger across the nephron. We use that, therefore, to define uh, a patient at high risk for acute kidney injury. One of the reasons this works well, I think, is because there's lots of different risks. I'm here to tell you that although um, probably not this audience, but uh, we go outside into the, into the community at large and we ask people, what's the cause of acute kidney injury in, in cardiac surgery patients? Oh, it's lack of volume, it's pre-renal. And yet the biggest predictor of acute kidney injury pre-op is an elevated right atrial pressure. Uh, so it's probably less to do about inadequate volume and more to do with uh, right heart failure and in some cases even volume overload. The kidney does not like to be, to have a back pressure on it. It is a, uh, it's an account capsule, it can't distend, and, it, and, and perfusion is impaired when there's too much back pressure, so don't flood the patient uh, with volume. But anyway, there's lots of different causes of AKI, uh, and these markers seem to predict, uh, seem to respond with any sort of stress. So whether the stress is pharmacologic because you gave a nephrotoxin, whether the stress is because you released a bunch of damps when you did a big operation and to the circulation and damage associated molecular patterns like myoglobe and HMGB1 and uric acid, those make the mark markers go up, lack of perfusion makes the markers go up, uh, lack of oxygen makes the markers go up. So pretty much anything that makes the kidney unhappy uh, and, and under any sort of stress, these biomarkers uh, increase. What can you do with this information? Well, it appears that by, uh, by selecting patients that have a high risk of AKI on the basis of, of these biomarkers, you can then apply common sense but rarely practiced uh, technique. So uh, there was a discussion about Tordal. I think Tordal is a great drug, but I wouldn't give it to somebody who's about to develop AKI. I would give it to somebody who's very low risk for AKI. So the negative predictive value of this biomarker is 98%. If it's negative, yeah, have at the Toradol. If it's positive, I probably wouldn't use it. Other, uh, other, non other uh, nephrotoxic drugs like ACE inhibitors, uh, et cetera, I wouldn't use in patients that are at high risk for AKI as identified by biomarker. Hyperglycemia, now you might say, well, I'm gonna treat everybody with tight glucose control, but you're gonna make some patients hypoglycemic, as has been shown. You might want to identify patients that are at more likely to benefit from the tight control and, uh, than, than apply it to everyone. Volume status, and this is actually in some cases giving less fluid to patients. What Alex Arbach did in this study was he basically said, look, I'm not going to give fluid to people unless they can demonstrate that they will respond to the fluid by a systolic, uh, by a stroke volume variation greater than 12 percent. And he said, if they're not in that space, I'm not going to give them fluid. I'm going to titrate the vasopressors, uh, and if the cardiac index is low, I'm going to give them inotropes. And what he showed was two things. One is only a third of patients had a biomarker that was positive. So he excluded two thirds of the patients from the intervention entirely. The second thing he showed was in this highly enriched population now, he was able to show I could dro they keep drop the rate of AKI from 71%, that's any AKI, uh, or 44% uh, for severe, moderate to severe AKI, and he could decrease both of those uh, significantly. Um, this is uh, another study in general surgery patients showing ex almost exactly the same thing. The intervention was a little bit different. They included a nephrology consult, mostly to actually get the drugs right. So the nephrologist came and said, look, you know, this is a nephrotoxic drug, you should do this. This is a renally clear drug, you should dose it differently. And what they found was, and then they had a fluid optimization as well, and what they found was that although it was a small study in their primary endpoint they missed, which was any AKI, although the p-value is, is almost significant, stage 2-3 AKI was significant. 
uh, as was hospital length of stay. Uh, there, we did an ad key on this uh, topic recently in Croatia. Uh, Dan participated in that as well as uh, several uh, other cardiac surgeons, vascular surgeons, cardiac anesthetists, uh, pharmacists, uh, intensivists, uh, who else do we have, nephrologists. Um, and uh, uh, we came up with a whole host of, uh, uh, of uh, countermeasures, if you will, that will be published uh, in, uh, in the, uh, the uh, uh, JHA, JAHA uh, was accepted just recently, so that'll be out soon. Um, just want to touch on two things as my t seconds tick away. Uh, vancomycin. Vancomycin. We do a lot of damage with vancomycin, and it's not clear to me that we're needing it in most patients. Most patients who undergo cardiac surgery uh, don't really have an allergy to penicillin. You know, we find out what they had, uh, and you know, their their uh, their left ear itched uh, when someone gave them penicillin back in in you know 1968. Uh, that's not an indication for vancomycin. Uh, house staff think that everybody's going to have MRSA. That's uh, not an indication uh, for vancomycin. So um, be careful with vancomycin. Yeah. Uh, saline. Stop using saline. I think that's less of a problem in cardiac surgery than it is in general surgery and it is certainly medical ICUs. Uh, but saline is, is associated with a significant risk. Now, it's, it's, granted, it's only a small change. If you move away from saline, you have about a 1% absolute risk reduction of what we call major adverse kidney events, which is death, dialysis, or persistent renal dysfunction. But 1% absolute risk reduction across the millions of patients who receive IV fluids is a big deal. Uh, when ABC News called me and said, why don't people stop using saline? Uh, I, they caught me flat-footed. You know, they said, look, you've been publishing on this for 20 years and people are still using saline, why? And I said, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, I think it's inertia. I think it's ever, I wish I had Kevin's talk because I think it's exactly why people continue to use saline, so stop using it. So in conclusion, markers of cell cycle arrest appear to be uh, robust measures of risk for AKI manifesting in the next 12 to 24 hours. A negative test only protects you for the next 12 hours because it, it can't, it's not a crystal ball. It's telling you whether the kidney's under stress. So if you still have concern 12 hours later, you can measure it again. Understanding the biology, uh, the underlying biology, sorry, of uh, this marker is an alarm phase marker. So it's really stress, not damage. Uh, the KDGO bundle, which is what Alex Arbach applied to his patients, can reduce uh, AKI when applied to biomarker positive patients after cardiac and non-cardiac surgery. Nephrotoxic drug exposure accounts for as much as 30% of all of the AKI that we see see in the ICU and it contributes to at least half. Stop using saline and try to limit vancomycin use because it's extremely overused uh, in uh, particularly in North America uh, when there are other viable options available. With that, I thank you for your attention.